I'd like to acknowledge uh, Curtis. He's been a, a big help to us in the intermediate rainfall zone. He, he's been there and done that. And Curtis, one of the interesting things was we always thought you could fertilize when you planted canola. He uh, straightened us out. Uh, the other thing we learned in the intermediate rainfall zone is that uh, seeding really early in the summer may not necessarily be the best way to do it. <laughs> so anyway, he has been a real uh, help to us. Uh, which one? I think it should be that one. This one? Yep. Try it. Anyway. Ah, they are up there. Um, the first slide shows you my grandson who is sitting beside me in the tractor. Um, he enjoys that and I enjoy having him there on occasion, but he gets awful nervous and goes through a lunchbox full of food in about an hour, so that's why he really <laughs> wants to come out there. We'll try the clicker here and make sure it works. Yep. Yep. Uh, up in the that corner up there is where I farm along Highway 2. Uh, Jim Nolemeyer is here, and he's another one of the experimental experimenters. I farm with two other individuals. Todd Carsons is here too. Uh, I see Jason Echobarger sitting back there. We all kind of um, uh, look at each other and, and do some uh, uh, things uh, differently and, and the same to try to learn. Um, the beginning was in the 1990s. Uh, Intermountain Canola came into our area and uh, kind of tried to establish a program uh, with edible oil seeds. And uh, the reason we did start it very, very similar to what Curtis mentioned was uh, we had problems with the winter annuals, the cheat grasses, uh, goat grass was coming in at that time also. Um, Intermountain gave us a uh, a guaranteed return, which was a, a good beginning economically. As Dean Bernardo was talking, I was thinking, oh yes, how true it is. Uh, economics have played a big factor in this. Um, and at that time, the grain prices were low again. And so this looked like an, uh, a good fit into our program. Um, we stayed with Intermountain for a few years, but the reasons we stopped growing were the bottom one is probably the main one. They left the area. It was not being very profitable for them, and as you can imagine, it was not very profitable for us. Uh, we were still using a conventional system of tillage at that time, which meant when you were planting spring canola, you lost a lot of your moisture before you got it in the ground. Uh, the other thing was that these varieties were not well adapted and we had low yields. Broadleaf weeds began to be a problem and frost in our area became a really significant problem. It was not uncommon to have to replant around the end of May because we'd had a frost and uh, that's something that Curtis probably doesn't get into as much as we do but in spring production uh, frost was definitely a, a disadvantage for us. Uh, then in the late 90s, uh, we began in kind of an experimental era. We were still um, trying to uh, do some things with broadleaves, canola and mustard. And what we began to evolve into was, was planting a little more mustard. It was a little less expensive to grow because we didn't have to spray it for aphids and that sort of thing. And uh, it was a little more competitive. Uh, it established itself a little better and formed a little better cover more quickly and then we didn't have the weed problems. Uh, when we first started into uh, the direct seed system, we were substituting summer fallow with uh, a broadleaf, uh, mustard or canola, and then using uh, that as a replant for uh, that stubble as a replant for winter wheat. And so we started down that road. And um, that experimental era ended also because, again, yield and price. We were the highest spring canola yield I ever had was 1,200 pounds with Hyola, 301 I think it was. Uh, mustard it never could get over 1,000 pounds. And so those two things uh, just did not work well. And again, as I mentioned, uh, mustard was the better of the two. Um, and then we began to shift our cropping patterns because we found that we could produce better spring wheats and barleys with the direct seeding. We, we could conserve the moisture a little more uh, and so we were getting better yields there. And again, frost was rearing its ugly head. It was not uncommon uh, to have us out there reseeding around uh, the end of May because we had lost the crop. 
And I mentioned one other thing. Uh, during that time, I was using a single disc John Deere uh, drill to plant these crops. And what I discovered toward the end of planting them was that there was such low disturbance there and so much cover on the ground that we were much more subject to frost damage than we would if we were to use a hole opener and open that ground up and expose some black dirt. And so to this day now we are using for spring planting or did this year a hole opener and that seemed to prevent a lot of the frost damage. And I observed that looking when the, there was damage if we actually had a black spot the canola lived in areas where there was a lot of residue, it died. And so that was one of the, one of the lessons that we learned. Uh, this is a picture of our farm from the west and there's the winter canola. We transitioned into winter canola and one of the technicians I work with out of the NRCS is gonna like this. Why did we go to winter canola? Why did we plant a broadleaf at all? Conservation stewardship program. It meant a little more cash in our pockets and uh, we could afford to experiment with these things a little more. So we went to winter canola. First year we tried it, a lot of us planted a few acres, froze flat to the ground. Uh, survival rate was spotty. So we were thinking, oh boy, here we go again. But that has changed. We have had, uh, the year after that, we had severe burn down. Uh, actually, the plants came up in the spring uh, and started to bolt. I mean, they hardly put any leaves at all on. They had been burned down that severely. But we, are, we have established fairly good yields, around 3,000 pounds. Uh, with a fairly decent price as, as of late. And, and as Curtis said, uh, we're making more money with our winter canola than we are actually with our winter wheat. The other thing I think that allowed us to transition to uh, canola was more suitable equipment. And uh, this afternoon in the session, I'll show you some things, but we're using, uh, we're using uh, different fertilizer technology and, and some other things. And one of the main things is the harvest capability. The newer combines with the headers that are able to swallow that huge amount of biomass and put it through the machine with a minimum of problems has made a huge difference in looking at it as, it, as it, a, a crop that you might want to grow. And of course, the rotational benefits and with spodinum, we've been able to uh, pretty much eliminate the shatter problems, which were a big problem. When we raised canola, spring canola in the past, we always had to swath it. It was another expense, uh, uh, all of those sort of things that go on with it. Um, this slide shows you kind of a, a summary of why actually we think maybe we're going to go back to a little more in the way of, of broadleaf crops. It's a rotational crop with return. And I was part of the Wilkie uh, project and Aaron knows what that was all about and we tried millet and we tried canola and some other people tried safflower and corn and buckwheat and all kinds of different things. Uh, none of those are grown in our area now. Uh, the canola, the broadleaf is the one thing that has remained. We're seeing evidence of a, a great improvement in soil quality with this crop. We get a deep taproot that allows for better drainage, infiltration, and storage. And with the mustard especially, I think we had some real effect on wheat root diseases. Uh, those are all anecdotal kinds of evidence, but it's pretty apparent that it was really helpful in the following crops of winter wheat or spring wheat. Um, as you notice by that slide, that's a picture of the canola that we planted this fall, actually planted in August, and as you can see, it prevents erosion pretty much. That, the ground is basically pretty well covered. Um, it suppresses weeds. We've had very little problems with broadleaf weeds because there's nothing for them to do under that canopy. It's uh, total darkness, so they don't tend to germinate. Adapted varieties. University of Idaho is our choice of varieties, and they have done an excellent job in, in uh, de delivering to us some varieties that are really, really adaptable and seem to be able to stand the winters very well. Spring canola, um, I told my two partners this year that they were nuts for planting spring canola, over 2,000 pounds. Now, 
I'll see how that holds. But um, it, it was a real revelation that you can grow some pretty good spring canola under direct seed. I think the other thing is the insurance programs have become more viable and provided a little more protection. And finally is this economics of added diversity. As we got into the direct seed system, one of the really key things that we always heard was rotation and have not all your eggs in one basket. And I think that's what canola will, will provide for us is, is the added surety that we have other sources of income. And as we're pretty limited in this area because we can grow small grains and canola and maybe a few other things, but we're pretty limited. And so uh, at least in our area, this has been a real benefit. This slide, I would like to just point out that there are a couple ways of going at it. And um, you can ready, fire, aim. I learned this from uh, Carl Coopers, who was really instrumental in a lot of this different kinds of rotational crops. But he and I were talking one day, and I've always been a little bit frightened about doing the first one. But the second one, and I think even after 20 years, we're still looking at a lot of things that we need to learn. And the survey that it was just done pretty well points out that a lot of us are still unsure of what what to do and how to do it all the time but that it is it, it is something that I think we'll we'll begin to look at um, this is uh, my twin grandchildren looking at that field you saw on the first slide after it's been harvested looking the opposite way and uh, they're eight years old and they're the joy of our lives and I hope someday that they'll see a farm that's full of all kinds of rotational crops. So I want to thank you and I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank WSU and this program. The field day in our area last year was excellent. We all, I think, that have been growing and learned just a tremendous amount. And Frank Young even learned a couple of things at that program that day. We had a <laughs> heated discussion, Frank, didn't we, about what, what herbicide would work best. So anyway, it was a good exchange. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, we'll look forward to some questions later. Thank you.